Hello to chapter 87 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And this chapter is titled The Great Armada. The long and narrow peninsula of Malacca, extending southeastward from the territories of Birma, forms the most southerly point of all Asia. In a continuous line from that peninsula stretch, the long islands of Sumatra, Java, Bali and Timor, which, with many others, form a vast mole or rampart, lengthwise connecting Asia with Australia and dividing the long unbroken Indian Ocean from the thickly studded Oriental archipelagos. This rampart is pierced by several sally ports for the convenience of ships and whales, conspicuous among which are the Straits of Sunda and Malacca. By the Straits of Sunda, chiefly vessels bound to China from the west emerge into the China seas. Those narrow straits of Sunda divide Sumatra from Java and standing midway in that vast rampart of islands, buttressed by that bold green promontory known to seamen as Java Head, they not a little correspond to the central gateway opening into some vast walled empire, and considering the inexhaustible wealth of spices and silks and jewels and gold and ivory, with which the thousand islands of that oriental sea are enriched, it seems a significant provision of nature that such treasures, by the very formation of the land, should at least bear the appearance, however ineffectual, of being guarded from the all-grasping western world. The shores of the Straits of Sunda are unsupplied with those domineering fortresses which guard the entrances to the Mediterranean, the Baltic and the Propontis. Unlike the Danes, these Orientals do not demand the obsequious homage of lower topsails from the endless procession of ships before the wind, which for centuries past by night and by day have passed between the islands of Sumatra and Java, freighted with the costliest cargoes of the East. But while they freely wave a ceremonial like this, they do by no means renounce their claim to more solid tribute. Time out of mind, the piratical proas of the Malays lurking among the low shaded coves and islets of Sumatra have sallied out upon the vessel sailing through the straits, fiercely demanding tribute at the point of their spears, though by the repeated bloody chastisements they have received at the hands of European cruisers, the audacity of these corsairs has of late been somewhat repressed. Yet, even at the present day, we occasionally hear of English and American vessels which, in those waters, have been remorselessly boarded and pillaged. With a fair fresh wind, the Peacock was now drawing nigh to these straits. Ahab purposing to pass through them into the Java seas and thence cruising northwards over waters known to be frequented here and there by the sperm whale, sweep inshore by the Philippine Islands and gain the far coast of Japan in time for the great whaling season there. By these means, the circumnavigating Peacock would sweep almost all the known sperm whale cruising grounds of the world previous to descending upon the line in the Pacific, where Ahab, though everywhere else foiled in his pursuit, firmly counted upon giving battle to Moby Dick. In the sea he was most known to frequent, and at a season when he might most reasonably be presumed to be haunting it. But how now, in this zoned quest, does Ahab touch no land? Does his crew drink air? Surely he will stop for water. Nay, 
for a long time now the circus running sun has raced within his fiery ring and needs no sustenance but what's in himself. So, Ahab, mark this too in the whaler, while other hulls are loaded down with alien stuff to be transferred to foreign wharfs, the world-wandering whale ship carries no cargo but herself and crew, their weapons and their wants. She has a whole lake's contents bottled in her ample hold. She is blasted with utilities, not altogether with unusable pig lead and kentledge. She carries years' water in her, clear old prime Nantucket water, which, when three years afloat, the Nantucketer in the Pacific prefers to drink before the brackish fluid, but yesterday rafted off in casks from the Peruvian or Indian streams. Hence it is that while other ships may have gone to China from New York and back again touching at a score of ports, the whale ship in all that interval, may not have sighted one grain of soil, her crew having seen no man but floating seamen like another flood, like themselves. So that did you carry them the news that another flood had come, they would only answer, Well, boys, here's the ark. Now, as many sperm whales had been captured off the western coast of Java in the near vicinity of the Straits of Sunda, indeed, as most of the ground roundabout was generally recognized by the fisherman as an excellent spot for cruising, therefore, as the peacock gained more and more upon Java ahead, the lookouts were repeatedly hailed and admonished to keep wide awake, but though the green palmy cliffs of the land soon loomed on the starboard bow, and with the lighted nostrils the fresh cinnamon was snuffed in the air, yet not a single jet was descried, almost renouncing all thought of falling in which any game hereabouts. The ship had well nigh entered the straits when the customary cheering cry was heard from aloft, and ere long a spectacle of singular magnificence salute, saluted us. But here be it premised that owing to the unwearied activity with which of late they have been hunted all over four oceans, the sperm, whale, the sperm whales, instead of almost invariably sailing in small detached companies, as in former times, are now frequently met with in extensive herds, sometimes embracing so great a multitude that it would almost seem as if numerous nations of them had sworn solemn league and covenant for mutual assistance and protection. To this aggregation of sperm whale into such immense caravans may be imputed the circumstance that even in the best cruising grounds you may now sometimes sail for weeks and months together without being greeted by a single spout, and then be suddenly saluted by what sometimes seems thousands on thousands. Broad on both bows, at the distance of some two or three miles and forming a great semicircle, embracing one half of the level horizon, a continuous chain of whale jets were up playing and sparkling in the noonday air. Unlike the stra straight perpendicular twin jets of the right whale, which dividing at top, falls over in two branches like the cleft drooping boughs of a willow, the single forward slanting spout of the sperm whale presents a thick curled bush of white mist continually rising and falling away to leeward. Seen from the peacock's deck, then, as she would rise on a high hill of the sea, this host of vapory spouts individually curling up into the air and beheld through a blending atmosphere of bluish haze showed like the thousand cheerful chimneys of some dense metropolis, descried of a balmy autumnal morning by some horseman on a height. 
as marching armies approaching an unfriendly defile in the mountains accelerate their march, all eagerness to place that perilous passage in their rear and once more expand in comparative security upon the plain. Even so did this vast fleet of whales now seem hurrying forward through the straits, gradually contracting the wings of their semicircle and swimming on in one solid but still crescentic centre. Crowding all sail, the peacock pressed after them, the harponiers handling their weapons and loudly cheering from the heads of their yet suspended boats. If the wind only held little doubt, had they, that chased through these straits of Sunda, the vast host would only deploy into the oriental seas to witness the capture of not a few of their number. And who could tell whether in that congregated caravan Moby Dick himself might not temporarily be swimming, like the worshipped white elephant in the coronation procession of the Siamese. So, with stun sail piled on stun sail, we sailed along, driving these leviathans before us. When, of a sudden, the voice of Tashtigo was heard loudly directing attention to something in our wake. Corresponding to the crescent in our van, we beheld another in our rear. It seemed formed of detached white vapors, rising and falling, something like the spouts of the whales, only they did not so completely come and go, for they constantly hovered without finally disappearing. Leveling his glass at his sight, Ahab quickly revolved in his pivot hole, crying, Aloft there, and rig whips and buckets to wet the sails! Malay, sir, and after us! As if too long lurking behind the headlands, till the peacock should fairly have entered the straits, these rascally Asiatics were now in hot pursuit to make up for their overcautious delay. But when the swift peacock with a fresh leading wind, no, leading wind, let me do that again, but when the swift peacock with a fresh leading wind was herself in hot chase, how very kind of these tawny philanthropists to assist in speeding her on to her own chosen pursuit, mere riding whips and rolls to her that they were. As with glass under arm, Ahab to and fro paced the deck in his forward turn, beholding the monsters he chased, and in the after one the bloodthirsty pirates chasing him. Some such fancy as the above seemed his, and when he glanced upon the green walls of the water, to read the file in which the ship was then sailing, and bethought him that through that gate lay the route to his vengeance, and beheld how that through that same gate he was now both chasing and chasing and being chased to his deadly end, and not only that, but a herd of remorseless wild pirates and inhuman atheistical devils were infernally cheering him on with their curses. When all these conceits had passed through his brain, Ahab's brow was left gaunt and ribbed like the black sand beach after some stormy tide has been gnawing it without being able to drag the firm thing from its place. But thoughts like these troubled very few of the reckless crew, and when, after steadily dropping and dropping the pirates astern, the peacock at last shot by the vivid green cockatoo point on the Sumatra side, emerging at last upon the broad waters beyond, then the harponeers seemed more to grieve that the swift whales had been gaining upon the ship than to rejoice that the ship had so victoriously gained upon the Malays. But still driving on in the wake of the whales, at length they seemed abating their speed. Gradually the ship neared them, and the wind, now dying away, word was passed to spring to the boats 
but no sooner did the herd, by some presumed wonderful instinct of the sperm whale, become notified of the three keels that were after them, though as yet a mile in their rear, then they rallied again, and forming in close ranks and battalions, so that their spouts all looked like flashing lines of stacked bayonets, moved on with redoubled velocity. Stripped to our shirts and drawers, we sprang to the white ash and after several hours pulling were almost disposed to renounce the chase when a general pausing commotion among the whales gave animating tokens that they were now at last under the influence of that strange perplexity of inert irresolution which, when the fishermen perceive it in the whale, they say he is gallied. The compact martial columns in which they had been hitherto rapidly and steadily swimming were now broken up into one measureless rout, and like King Porus's elephants in the Indian battle with Alexander, they seemed going mad with consternation, in all directions expanding in vast irregular circles and aimlessly swimming hither and thither by their short thick spoutings, they plainly betrayed their distraction of panic. This was still more strangely evinced by those of their number, who, completely paralyzed as it were, helplessly floated like water-locked dismantled ships on the sea. Had these leviathans been but a flock of simple sheep, pursued over the pasture by three fierce wolves, they could not possibly have evinced such excessive dismay. But this occasional timidity is characteristic of almost all herding creatures. Though banding together in tens of thousands, the lion-maned buffaloes of the West have fled before a solitary horseman. Witness to all human beings how, when herded together in the sheepfold of a theatre's pit, they will, at the slightest alarm of fire, rush helter-skelter for the outlets, crowding, trampling, jamming, and remorselessly dashing each other to death. Best, therefore, withhold any amazement at the strangely gallied whales before us for there is no folly of the beasts of the earth which is not infinitely outdone by the madness of man. So I'll stop here for today. Bye-bye. Till next time with the next part of this chapter.